Listen up, get ready, I'm not gonna take no more There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul Buckle up, get ready, we're not gonna say Sisters and brothers, all citizens of the world It's time for another edition of the Live from the Heartland show I'm in Chicago and I'm Michael James and I'm really glad to be here uh, I've got three guests coming up today. We're going to start off with uh, our old pal, Carl Davidson. Uh, he was a national officer in Students for Democratic Society. He's involved with the uh, online university of the left, and he's always a guy with a lot of good information and a really good perspective. We're also going to have uh, our good pal, Gordon Thompson, former cross-country coach at both Loyola and at DePaul. And he's going to come on and talk a little bit about the World Cup and uh, Lonnie Grenier and or Griner, uh, who is incarcerated in uh, Russia. And then I think we're going to have a woman named Andrea Bunch coming on talking about uh, some musical events coming up. So this will be uh, number 129 for the week of 12, uh, the 3rd of uh, December. And uh, when I say 129, that's since the pandemic began. We've been doing it for many more years than that. And our home base is WLUW 88.7 Chicago Sound Alliance. Um, one good thing I saw in leading up to the show was the Treasury Department uh, has just handed over six years of Donald Trump's tax returns to Congress. Let's hope something good comes out of that. Not for Donald Trump. Um, uh, on bad news, the uh, U.S. Appeals Court has rejected Biden's bid to revive this, uh, the student debt plan. Um, uh, uh, in New Orleans, I think uh, the, the court uh, ruled, uh, it declined to put on hold a Texas judge's ruling that said Biden's plan to cancel hundreds of millions of billions of dollars in student debt was unlawful. Um, and the the decision was made by a court that had two Republican appointees and one Obama appointee. And uh, so we're going to have to just wait and see what happens with the student debt question. Uh, in case you missed last week, we had our old friend Mike Klonsky talking about his not only his radio show, but politics around the world. We had Bobby Wilson, the son of Jackie Wilson, uh, talking about his dad and his own music. And we had Eric Graff from Heirloom Books. Uh, here in Chicago in Edgewater, not too far from uh, Rogers Park. And uh, that you can find that at youtube.com slash heartlandmedia slash videos. Um, let me see. Uh, on the labor front, the House has uh, approved uh, a bill to avoid a potential rail strike. There's a lot of controversy around this. Uh, there are two parts in their approval. One was the bill to to stop the strike from going forward if uh, the unions decided to do that. The other was uh, giving uh, sick pay. Uh, one of the, the issues is the workers want seven days or more of sick pay. And um, the uh, we'll see what happens in the Senate, whether we can get 60 votes to pass each of those parts of that bill or just one. Uh, and take note, there are uh, a lot of uh, uh, teaching assistants and faculty people around the country, mainly I'm talking teaching assistants on strike at campuses at Yale University, University of California. Um, you know, the National Labor Relations Board has been more favorable to unions uh, in recent years. And uh, there's a lot of people out on strike, 4,000 people at Yale University, 3,500 at Northwestern University. Uh, it's going on. So pay attention and we'll have more on that. Uh, in the sports world, we're going to be back with Gordon Thompson. We'll talk World Cup then. Um, a little bit of sports history, though. Uh, on this day, December 3rd, that would be in 56, uh, Bill Russell and Casey Jones, uh, two outstanding Hall of Fame basketball players, won the fourth consecutive Olympic gold medal with an 89-55 victory over the Soviet Union at the Melbourne Games. And in 1941, Japanese Emperor Hirohito signed a declaration of war. Uh, sad note, Christine McVeigh of uh, Fleetwood Mac passed away at 79. And close to home, a couple of things. In the 49th Ward, 
Network 49, a political action uh, organization, uh, uh, will hold, will, is basically working on uh, getting ready for the February elections. And one of the things that will be happening there will be choosing the district council for the Chicago 24th Police District. And um, we, Network 49, on Wednesday, December 7th at 6.30, are going to have an endorsement sessions where people present their their case why they should be uh, assigned to that position. So if you want to know more about that, go to www.network49.net and participate in choosing who will be the watchdogs over the local police. Um, and up in Evanston, uh, just starting is. Uh, uh, the uh, Daniel Biss, the mayor, let us know that the first payments in Evanston's guaranteed income program are going out. These are the first of 12 uh, 500 monthly distributions that 150 randomly selected eligible individuals and families will receive. Um, and this guaranteed income uh, movement is popping up around the country, including Chicago and in Cook County. Okay, I think that'll be it for the banner. We've got a bunch of guests coming on. So uh, stay tuned. We're going to have a little short musical break, and we'll be right back with more Live from the Heartland. Hey, hey, welcome back to the Live from the Heartland show for the week of December 3rd. Uh, Michael James, and I'm really happy to bring on someone I've known since the middle 60s, a young fellow named Carl Davidson, uh, who was... Uh, I like that young fellow part. <laughs> say what? I said I like that young fellow part. The young fellow part, yeah. <laughs> we went way back. Uh, we were both in SDS together. We were kind of part of the... Uh, very populist movement uh, within SDS. Um, we, uh, you know, you were at the University of Nebraska, one of my favorite places. And um, we, uh, you actually helped me for a while. We're one of the uh, co-publishers of Heartland the, Journal. Of the Heartland Journal, yeah. So Carl, fill us in what you've been doing now. We go way back, but we'd love to hear about what you're doing these days and how you uh, how do you see the world right now? Well, I moved back to uh, after many years in Chicago. You know, came time to require retire, and I decided to move back home. It grew on me every time I went to visit for holidays, and I decided that uh, Beaver County in Western Pennsylvania, uh, I'm a town here is called Alaquipa, is claim to fame as uh, uh, football stars. It used to be the largest steel mill in the world. Now it's the largest brownfield in the world. We used to be the most blue collar county in the whole country. Now we're the oldest people county in the whole country. So <laughs> that's because of deindustrialization. Uh, we, we were ground zero for having the mill shut down and uh, people thrown out of the street and everything like that. So Pittsburgh is one thing. Uh, Pittsburgh is a great town. I call it the Paris of Appalachia. It's just uh, 17 miles up the river. But all along the river, and the, uh, the Monongahela as well as Ohio, there are all these mill towns. And uh, that's a different reality. That's what I'm living in now. And uh, it's a very different politics than uh, Chicago. And so, in a way, I'm glad. I'm glad I moved to, moved back because I've got to. Well, um, the main I moved back for a lot of personal reasons. I saw somebody the other day. Since I moved back, I've been to ten funerals, and uh, they were all family and people I got to spend time with uh, before they passed on. So now I'm the patriarch of the family. But um, uh, in any case, it's a different political reality. Um, the county is fifty fifty. Um, or I shouldn't say the, the county, the uh, congressional district is 50-50 Trump versus the Democrats. The county is 60-40 pro-Trump, even though it's 90% white workers. 
um, minority nationalities like African Americans, about nine, ten percent. Uh, so it says it's quite different in Chicago. But uh, so learning how to do radical socialist politics in this reality is a uh, is very important. As a, this is um, a more like um, a lot of the country than say Chicago, New York, or the Bay Area. You know, Carl, I uh, Aliquippa rings a bell, and it, it used to be a pretty strong union uh, town. Yes. And then uh, you had a guy came out of there named Mike Ditka, who right. Uh, right. kind of was very conservative and right wing. And I always thought that was a pretty heavy contradiction and didn't really like Ditka that much for a number of reasons. Right. And you were, you're correct. <laughs> a lot of people don't like around here don't like him for those reasons uh, either. Are you working doing it in local politics, like oh, yeah. uh, working with the Democratic Party, et cetera? Well, I work with a group called Progressive Democrats of America, uh, which is sort of an independent left wing fraction of the Democrat that works under the Democratic Party tent. Uh, the Democratic Party uh, in our group has gotten so weak after the collapse of the union. It was a, a very strong union. But after the uh, union folded and the mill was folded, Democratic Party here was gutted. So, so we've taken it upon ourselves to kind of work to help rebuild it along. So the progressive, you know, it's a, it, you know, the, the local Democratic Party here now is pretty progressive now, mainly because of the, the work that a lot of us have done. But uh, we still keep our own independent organization, Progressive Democrats of America. And then I work with a bunch of other left groups, you know, DSA, Liberation Road, CCDS, a bunch of, you know, I do. I'm a left unity guy, you know, I join all of them and encourage them to uh, work together as much as they can. Well, that's quite a challenge being a unifier of the left. Because <laughs> uh, people will go at each other a whole lot. Uh, let me just ask you, you mentioned the congressional district. Is it, yeah. uh, do you have a Republican or a Democratic? We have a Democrat. In fact, we did pretty well. Now that we, uh, we, we ran the table in the last election. Everyone yeah, tell us a little bit about the Democrats and Fetterman and that whole campaign. Well, Fetterman, Fetterman, Fetterman is a kind of left-wing populist. You know, everybody around here loves him. Uh, white workers love him, too. Uh, you know, he's a huge guy, six foot eight, and he's a uh, um, very working class. But he's mayor of Braddock, you know. But he's out up front on lots of issues. Like before, when they were de um, debating gay, gay marriage in the White House, whether Obama was going to back it on, he says, no. He said, I'm mayor, but if any gay people want to get married, come over to the mayor's office. I'll marry you. <laughs> and things like that. You know, so he, he gets out by his feast for free marijuana and all that, um, you know, legalizing marijuana and all that stuff. But he's also very down to earth on on um, on uh, economic questions. So things that are important to the working class. He's a little uh, he's a little too much to the center on fracking, but all in all, people like him a lot. And not only left the people, but to the work, workers generally like him. And that's why even though he had he suffered that stroke, you know, and had medical problems, he was still able to whip the butt of um, Oz, uh, you know, the guy Trump put up. Josh Shapiro, our uh, new governor, he was attorney general. I spent a little bit of time talking to him. He's pretty good. He, he was, he, uh, as attorney general, he beat back about 20 different efforts by the Republicans to suppress voting, voter registration. Um, so that, that's how I got to know him. We, we sent bus, the unions here sent busloads to Earthburg uh, to back him up on all that stuff. So, uh, so he's good. And, and then the best of all is uh, from Pittsburgh, we elected uh, the first black woman um, to Congress. Um, Summer Lee is her name. And uh, she's also a, a member of DSA. So we uh, put in a, a black woman socialist. Now, the guy we elected to Congress is just, he's pretty much just a liberal, a liberal Democrat, nothing all that special about him. Uh, and um, he won, though, by you know a, a couple of percentage points. Uh, he was running against a guy who his only qualification is he had tons of money. And, uh, and so this guy, he, he did all right. I had a, I had a chat with him, and um, I tried to tell him that he there were two ways to govern this area. I said, you can govern it as a right center coalition, which case you'll just turn it over to the Republicans, or you can run it as a left progressive center coalition, in which case you'll do well. So he seems to 
That's what that's what he did. I don't I don't take credit for it, but that's what he did. Well, Carl, how do you see the world right now? Well, let's talk about the country first. How do you great, see what's great going disorder on? under heaven? <laughs> Say that again. Great disorder under heaven. That was my miles for phrase. Well, that's the truth. But well, give he, us a little. Give us a little take on how you see what's going on in the country and where you think. Well, I think I think going. the main thing to see in the world situation is is the uh, is it, it, there's an uh, emerging multipolar world. Uh, and the, the dominance of superpower hegemonism is weakening. Uh, China is doing uh, rather well. I'm, I'm still a friend of China, even though I'm critical of them on, on, a, on a few things. But generally speaking, I, I uh, still follow China. Uh, I don't think necessarily that their way of doing things is going to work here. But uh, <laughs> I think they're working well for the Chinese, let's put it that way. Uh, they're, they're doing pretty good. Even what's with your, these, what's your, well, you brought up the Chinese, but what's your take on uh, the kind of wave of demonstrations, which we haven't seen there very often? Well, I know. Well, they, 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 we don't see them, but they, that doesn't mean they're not there. They have, they have them all the time. Workers go on strike and everything all the time in China. You just okay. don't hear that, hear that much about it. I think that, uh, you know, China has a zero COVID policy. Here's the, here's the bottom line. China's policy has resulted in less than 6,000 people dying of COVID in a country four times as large as ours, whereas we have died somewhere between half a million and a million, depending on how you want to count. So you can criticize China's policy all you want, and you can you know, be frustrated by it, how strict it is. I mean, I have a friend who lives in Wuhan who told me, you know, he, they put him, he had to stay in his house uh, 24 7, and they would have members of the Young Communists League bring them food once a week in hazmat suits. <laughs> but on the other hand, only 6,000 people died in the whole of China. So well, that's pretty impressive, actually. That is, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, that doesn't mean, I think what you'll see, I mean, I follow the Chinese press on it as well as uh, uh, the regular press. What you'll see in China, you won't see them mention that uh, reporting, you know, Wahoo, lots of demonstrations. Uh, what they are reporting is that we're going to improve and adjust and make the adjustments. We're going to change the policies. So I expect there to be some loosening up and some, some concessions towards the protests. But uh, by and large, uh, China's done relatively well on COVID. And we, we, uh, there's a lot to learn from what they, uh, I mean, we want to talk about it. Is it. Our COVID policy is one of the worst in the world, especially given the toll it took. A million people were killed from it. Um, so a lot of people didn't care because, uh, you know, half of them were over, over 65, you know. Uh, and it was old, old people dying off. So, so Trump said, well, let them die off. That's better that we keep the stock market numbers up. You know, that shit don't fly in China. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how about uh, your take on the war in, in Ukraine? I'm with the Ukrainians. I'm right. uh, I'm a self-determination guy. Uh, no, well, all countries have the right to self-determination, respect for sovereignty. I agree with the UN, five principles of peaceful coexistence. I think Putin is a fascist. I think um, uh, Russia is an expansionist. I think they're, they're trying to uh, purge Europe of what they call Atlanticists, you know, people who believe in gay rights and stuff like that. They want to purge them all out of Europe. That's why uh, Putin supports every fascist group. He supports Le Pen in France and every other right wing group in every other European country because he's, you know, people you know, have this delusion. I think they're caught in a time warp about Russia. They think Russia is the old USSR. That, that's, that's ancient history. Yeah, <laughs> the, new Russia, the new Russia is something quite different. Uh, it's not nearly as strong as the US. Uh, even though it has more nuclear weapons than, than uh, anybody, um, but um, you know, so and, uh, those are uh, so that's my take on the world. It's you know a lot of things, and I'm, I'm with the. I hope I hope the Ukrainians win. I hope hope they can do it soon versus the toll is heavy. Yeah, it is. Well, Carl, one of the things uh, I, I I wouldn't mind getting your take on how you. Uh, well, I'll ask you that later. You, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about the new University of the yeah, Left, no, yeah, something I'm, I'm, you founded. Tell us yeah. a little bit about it. Well, I've been working on it.
I, I created. I used a web. It's a web. It's a. It's a. It's a web portal. So I use uh, the model of a, the online universities, and so I uh, I set up. Um, uh, you know, here's a di different departments. I created departments on anything you wanted to study. Say you wanted to study uh, 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 history, you go to here to the history department, and then these are all classes. They're all videos, so you can run them and project them on a wall. Uh, so that's uh, these are all different classes in the history oh, this, department. That's great. Let me uh, for the people and, who are who are listening in. Uh, he's showing us uh, his website on the online university of the left. Give us yeah. the uh, the call letters, so to just speak. Go, just people. Google, just Google online. Just ouleft.org is uh, uh, is uh, or just online university of the left in my name, and you'll, you'll find it. Uh, then we have a study guides department. Here we have all kinds of uh, different study groups, uh, materials for them. Uh, so, you know, for just all, all kinds of books here, we have archives. I've been I'm very eclectic. I include everybody. Uh, Stalin, Trotsky, anarchists, socialists, communists, uh, <laughs> revisionists. And, and so, you know, I don't discriminate against anybody. I mean, obviously, it has my own uh, bias to it. But, uh, you know, here's the thing on Ho Chi Minh and all his stuff, Mao Zedong. Uh, you know, uh, these are all the archives that take you to anything you want. And here's like, say, a book section uh, where we, uh, I, I, when I find interesting books and I can find them for free, I upload them here. So there's hundreds of books here on the left wing that you can, you want to get read Polonsis on or Gramsci, whatever you want. You can go there and you can read those. Over here in live classes, there's a few that I've done. Um, I, this is one I did a four-part series. This I did with workers here in, in Beaver County on the U.S. Constitution. Here's a three-part series I did on Gramsci. You can listen to me lecture everything you wanted to know about Gramsci. And, and well, this three, is good, three, Carl. Like Take us back to where we see you. And okay. I'm ask you I just want to show you. I just want to show you one more thing, and uh, and then let's see where the hell is it. Um, I had to get it for you listeners. He is uh, he is showing us his uh, really extensive website. Yeah. Now, um, now the, the 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 OUL puts out a weekly uh, newsletter. It's called Left Links, and uh, so if you I don't know if you get it. I'll have to make I sure do you. get it. I do okay. Get well, it. good. So it's good. It, you know, it, it it covers a lot of the things I find interesting each week, and then every Saturday morning we have a discussion of it called Saturday Morning Coffee. And uh, so if you go to the if you go to the left links, you can find the link or it's just uh, Saturday mornings. What time on Saturday morning? 1030 my time. That's 930 your time. Yeah, it's yeah. about ten. halfway through this show. <laughs> <laughs> ten, ten, we go 1030 to noon, 90 minutes. So, OK, anyway. let me Carl, let me ask you, uh, uh, you know, we do these kind of short segments. we got a couple more coming up. What is your uh, kind of advice to the older activists as well as to the youth? My activists to the youth drop this nonsense about how you don't like to read books. <laughs> I don't, I don't, you know, people come up with all these, oh, we don't read anymore. I said, poor shit. If you want to be a revolutionary, you've got to learn to read. And uh, so get to it. Um, I know all these older people who are barely literate who spend, spend uh, days studying the Bible and reading it in study groups all the time. Uh, I said, you ought to be able to do the same thing with Marx or Mao Zedong or whatever. So that's my advice to the youth. If you want to change the world, you've got to learn something about it. And you've got to stretch your mind a little bit. Uh, so that's why. But the main thing I tell them, I, I cheer them on. The main thing I tell them to be, uh, be audacious. Uh, and don't, don't worry about the making mistakes. You can always correct your mistakes. The biggest mistake is uh, to sit on your butt and not do anything. Carl Davidson. Uh Give us, uh, give us a little bit of wisdom here. Uh, just some words as we part. Uh, what some advice to the world or well, to the organizers out here? You know, I'm, a, I'm an old Maoist, you know, so I'll give you two little bits of mis wisdom from Mao uh, that most people probably never heard of. One is uh, Mao once said, when people, people question whether people could change. Mao said, everybody can change. Some people die first. 
<laughs> so I thought that was pretty wise. And some people, you know, they want to give up on everybody. You know, because around here, like I have a lot of my old high school buddies, you know, they they were uh, Biden, uh, uh, Obama to Trump flippers. They flipped over to Trump. You know, so so I talked to them all the time, you know, and trying to run back so people can change. So, and the other thing is, if you don't hit it, it won't fall. So, uh, you know, when you got nasty stuff standing up around you, you got to take a punch at it. So, well, I like that. <laughs> well, you know, the, what I recommend to my students, and I uh, I liked it myself every now and then, is to look through Mao Zedong, his writings on contradiction and the other one on practice. Right. They're Absolutely. Short, and they're really very helpful for people who are uh, trying to engage with others to bring about some kind of transformation in a positive direction. You know, my view is my, my up all during the 30s up to the revolution was absolutely brilliant. But after he took power, I'd, I'd give him a 70 30. He made, he made some big mistakes uh, um, going on. And um, he tried to save himself at the end by bringing Deng Xiaoping back in. And um, my one uh, uh, advice to a bunch of leftists is study Deng Xiaoping. He's really a very brilliant Marxist. Most people never read anything by him. They just know his little thing about white cat, black cat, and so on. Uh, and uh, that's about all they know. But uh, if you actually read what the man has to say, and Alex same goes for Chairman Xi. He's a pretty smart guy, too. Well, Carl Davidson, I hope I get to see you sometime. Uh, it's you're been welcome. a while. I think the last time I probably I'm close saw to the you airport, was... uh, 15 minutes away from Pittsburgh Airport. Got to play over or come here sometime. I'll, I'll come, come see you. If I'm, I, sometimes I drive through that part of the country, too. I'll, so. give, you a, I'll give you a guided tour uh, of, um, you know, Western Pennsylvania, Steel Valley, and uh, all our interesting thing and interesting politics. Got a lot well, going on. And I'll, Paris, the Paris of Appalachia, too. Except don't tell, don't tell too many people. We don't want people, too many people to find out. We just want young, young yuppies, social, young socialist yuppies to move here. Thanks for coming on, Carl. Hey, hey, we're back with more Live from the Heartland, and it's always a pleasure to bring on our, our resident sports reporter, our analyst, our friend, the coach, Gordon Thompson, all the way from Newark, Delaware. Good afternoon to you, Gordo. Good afternoon, Michael. Hello, Chicago. Great to be back with you on WLUW, my home station, back when I was working for Loyola University for 15 great years of my life. Well, it's a wonderful place, and there's a lot of great people, and we got a lot of good radio, and we love that WLUW is our home base, and that we every week get to play the current edition of Live from the Heartland on WLUW. And uh, as you know, we do have it other places. It's on Spotify and Google Podcasts these days. It's uh, on Can TV, and we are on YouTube.com slash Heartland Media forever, I hope. So the reason I asked you to come on today was because um, I got caught up in watching World Cup soccer. And, uh, you know, there was a big, a lot of hype about the Iran-US game. Uh, I got to watch, uh, I was at a medical thing for the first half of it, but I came back and it really, uh, it sucked me in. I tell you, it was very intense. US was on defense. And uh, I just wonder what your take is. And I know there is a bigger story than just the game itself. I mean, there's the geopolitical stuff around Iran and the U.S. and politics going on. Talk a little bit about the World Cup, Gordo. You know, the World Cup is one of the more phenomenal aspects in all of sports. And it's held every four years. So it's kind of like the Olympic Games. And uh uh, it's the championship, the world championship for the game of football. That's what the, the rest of the world terms soccer as football. So FIFA, the Federal International uh, Association for Football, they're the governing body. And they set up, uh, they picked the host country through a vote of FIFA's governing body. And they selected uh, Qatar in the city of Doha to be the host. And there's a lot of uh, conflict about that. 
Uh, did they use slave labor to build some of the stadiums? Uh, not slave, but really cheaply employed. And there was over 500 deaths in the process of building those seven stadiums. So that uh, was an, a wow. whole really, uh, really uh, stickling point in itself. Besides the point that you can't drink alcohol and other things in the in the city, although in the stands, I swear I saw some Mexicans yesterday uh, drinking beer in the stands. So I'm not sure if in the if in the stadium you can drink uh, alcohol or not. Anyhow, back to your U.S. game versus uh, Iran. Uh, it was yes, a really a tight game, a really. Um, very personal game in that U.S. definitely wanted to beat Iran and Iran really wanted to beat U.S. Um, we don't like each other. That's fine. Many countries don't like each other that are competing in this 32 country World Cup. Now the U.S. Is, has advanced to the final 16, which is called the knockout round, meaning that you lose one game in the next round and you're out, you're going home. But hey, we have uh, US is in the final 16. And uh, that game versus US versus Iran. And uh, afterwards, uh, during the press conference, a uh, I Irani journalist asked one of the US players, he stated, he didn't ask him, he said, hey, you're pronouncing our country all wrong. It is pronounced Iran. You are pronouncing it Iran. That is incorrect, the journalist said to this person. And I fully expected the athlete, the, the football player from the U.S. to respond, well, I don't speak Arabic. I speak English. I apologize to all the people in Iran. So I thought that's exactly what he was going to say is like keep his normal pronunciation. But uh, uh, you know, it's little tiddly bits. Uh, journalists don't like anybody. So did he come back? What did he say? The athlete, the athlete held his uh, ground and just did not comment at all. He yeah. did. He did the dignified thing. Well, you know, I watched this guy. Uh, there's a, a sports commentator professor. He teaches at the University of Maryland named Kevin Blackstone. And he really he talked about the bigger story, uh, what's going on in Iran. Uh, all the protests. He talked about sports as a, a platform for protest. Uh, he he actually um, he compared uh, the what the Iran Iranian uh, athletes face going home because you remember they got in some trouble because during the national anthem they stood up but they didn't sing, so they're kind of caught between the demonstrations and the government and. Uh, he talked about uh, how what happened to our guys when they went back home in 1968. Johnny, John Thomas and John Carlos and Tommy Smith and the kind of the scorn that they faced when they protested at the Olympics in 68. Any thoughts on any of that? Well, it's a, it's a totally different world today than it is from 1968. You cannot compare 2022 to 20, 1968, we have evolved as a world and not just as a country since then. Iran, Iran well, we're pretty, uh, they must get their crap together if they want it. So they got to provide rights for the women and you got to provide rights to be able to participate and it's freedom of press, freedom of speech, all like that. So, but they get to govern their, their own country the way they want to. But when you go to an international competition like this World Cup soccer, you got to behave properly as well, the, just the way the rest of the world behaves in there. So I don't hold, I think that's fine that they didn't uh, sing their national anthem, but it's going to be coming back when they return home. They got to think about what the repercussions are. It's entirely different from 1968 when John Carlos and, and um, Smith came back to, they were persona non grata. They couldn't get a job. They couldn't rent a house. They were, uh, because they were labeled as not real Americans. They, they were the first people to demonstrate in sport and they caught holy hell for it. And 
for maybe 10, 20, 30 years afterwards, they were paying the price domestically. And it's only recently that they've been revered statues on San Jose State campus. And now USA Track and Field has honored them as dignified citizens. So, but back then, Avery Brundage labeled them as, and good old Brent Musburger from Northwestern University said those two guys were like, uh, uh nazis it, working in bootstraps or something crazy brent, Screw, Mus brent, brent musburger screwed up big time and i still think he's a chump for saying that back in 1968 well i gotta tell you when i was in cuba for the pan-american games i think it was 91 uh brent musburger was bad mouthing the cubans because they ran out of chicken you know it, i i don't like them a lot myself anyhow so anyhow, sport is uh, has become a real platform for protest. Uh, we did have the German team, which lost, uh, doing some protest around the LGBT stuff. Uh, well, they just they just did this. They held their hand over their mouth, saying they were being uh, muted okay. by the local Doha or by FIFA. Uh, said that you could not wear an armband that would support uh, gay rights. So um, you know. That's some, I, hey, Germany is in jeopardy of not making it to the final 16. They got beat on their opening round. You know what? Yesterday, which was Wednesday, I watched the Mexico versus Saudi Arabia game. Oh, and they came close. They needed another goal. <laughs> I watched it on Telemundo, which was the most <laughs> fabulous I don't know much of Spanish, a little bit, but the Telemundo uh, broadcasters were so animated and so enthusiastic about what was going on in the field of play. I was riveted to the game and it was just it was so much fun watching Telemundo for that Mexico game. And I've got a new soccer hero, Chavez. What a great, a great, a great goal he served. Hey, well, we, in that U.S. versus Iran game, we did suffer a big penalty in. Uh, Christian Pulisic went down with an abdominal injury as he was scoring that goal. And he's been labeled by his teammates as Captain America. So he's supposed <laughs> to be our saver. So uh, uh, he's a real dynamic uh, forward and uh, a real striker up front. He's got a great mind for the game. He loves creating space for his teammates. And um, he's not done. He served, suffered with like maybe even a bruised spleen or a gallbladder. That knee to his gut when he was not ready to accept some was like Harry Houdini getting sucker punched uh, back way back when. And he died yeah. from that sucker punch. Harry did. So it's uh we'll see if if Christian Pelusa can get back in. I didn't like Christian on his earlier games because to me he was like a big crybaby. He would just overemphasize little ticky tack fouls, fall on the ground, roll around, carry on histrionics. They seem to all be falling on the ground. <laughs> they all do in soccer, and I can't stand it. And it's it's something that's definitely unique to the game of soccer is does taking dives and then fake dives, and then whenever you're on the ground, roll around and act like you're you're almost dead. And uh, so, and then 20 seconds later, they're up and perfectly normal. So uh, that's one of the reasons that soccer has not caught on in the United States. We don't like that fakeness. We don't like that drama that is really takes away from the game instead of adding the game. I think FIFA needs to add a new rule. If you take a dive, meaning that someone really hasn't contacted you and you're rolling around on the ground acting like you're in serious pain, that should be a yellow card. And a yellow card means that is a significant penalty. If an athlete gets two yellow cards, they're out of the game. And you can be no substitute for, for that player. So it would send a, dip, a big message. I got to say, I really uh, kind of like the, uh, the, uh, the U.S. team. I mean, it's a young team. There's only one guy left from the last World Cup. It's real multinational, so to speak. I mean, uh, you know, all different races and stuff on the team. I like that. Um, I got to say, we're going to we'll run out of time if we don't hit it. We wanted to talk a little bit about Brittany Grenier. Uh, you got any information on her these days? Yeah, uh, it's sad now that she's in this uh, 
IK2 penal colony. That's the same penal colony that a, a band member from Pussy Riot was incarcerated in. And the Pussy Riot band member says, hey, no one there speaks English. All of them, all of the guards are racist. So uh, she has, Brittany's got three strikes against her. One, she's black. Two, she's American. And then three, she's gay. So she's in a world of bad business in this penal colony where no one speaks English except for herself. So she's got to learn the rudiments of Russians to be able to communicate. And then she's got to fight for herself and she's got a hell of an athlete, but she's going to be in situations where the own uh, her fellow uh, penal people are going to be against her as well. Not just the guards. It's going to be the clientele is going to give her trouble as well. So um, Russia's is a really primitive place right now. Sure. And if you're in a penal colony, it's primitive times two. So um, what we cannot do is forget her. The no. our government must not forget her and must not let her waste. And that's the biggest crime, according to the Pussy Riot band member, is that's the biggest danger is, is that she'll be forgotten. So I'm worried about her because her own college coach at Baylor University, who's a woman, um, has no comment about the situation. So either her own college coach, she and her had a bad relationship or Brittany didn't. Uh, she wasn't a, a, a good person to her own college coach. So that's a danger signal. That right there is a dangerous signal. The, M the WNBA has stood up. Uh, very proudly in support of Brittany Geiner. It's not enough. More voices need to be said. And really, our government needs to take action, but not talk about it. Russia wants to do any, every all the negotiations in secret. OK, they're holding the cards. Play their game. Don't talk about what's going on, Joe Biden, in the press. Keep it secret. Keep it diplomatic. But may, let's get something done. Okay, well, I got one more question for you, comrade brother Gordon Thompson, and that is uh, you used to coach at Loyola. You had a number of All-Americans. Uh, you had quite a, uh, a storied history as a coach. Uh, Loyola continues to have some really good athletes, particularly on the cross-country team. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, the new coach at Loyola is um, Gavin Kennedy. I recruited and coached him for DePaul University once I left Loyola and went over to DePaul. And he did a great job at uh, DePaul, uh, ran a 407 mile or even quicker, and then uh, started his coaching career um, and went on to Wisconsin. And now he's at Loyola and doing a phenomenal job. This past fall, just a couple of weeks ago, we have a new All-American from Loyola in cross country, and uh, his name is Ryan Martins, and he was a transfer from Nebraska to Loyola, I think as a graduate student. Well, uh, Ryan finished 29th in the NC2A championship. Over 10K, he ran 29-28. That's hauling butt over cross country, over hill and dale to run under 30 minutes for 10,000 meters. That's booking. So he finished 29th. If you finish, I think, in the top 30, that's uh, an All-American status. That's actually better than the athletes that I coached uh, at the cross-country national championships of Eddie Slowakowski and Jim Westfall. They were 33rd and 35th, I think, in the NC2A championship. It's amazing. Loyola does have a former national champion, in the cross country. And that was Tom O'Hara back in 1964. Tom won the NC2A cross country, but it was over four miles, not 10,000 meters. So good old Tom, who uh, has left us now and is uh, running laps around in heaven and in the, in, in the Catholic way. And um, we've got the best feelings for Tom O'Hara's family, as well as all the O'Hara's that I coached. And uh, at Loyola, and uh, we're feeling good for, for Coach Kennedy at Loyola and Ryan Martins getting All-American status. Well, Gordon, it's always great to see you. Uh, I haven't seen you since you and I traveled around uh, in the spring. We were down in Florida, and uh, I'm sure we'll get to see each other again in the not too far off. 
Uh, you keep teaching and you keep uh, working on your sports analysis. You are very good at conveying some good information. And I want to thank you. And I look forward to seeing you in the not too far off. Thanks, Michael. Peace out, Chicago. Take care. All right, brother. Stay tuned here on the left end of your dial or wherever you're getting the show. And we'll be right back with more Live from the Heartland. Okay, welcome back to more Live from the Heartland for the week of December 3rd in the year 2022. And uh, it's really nice to have uh, not only some women on the show, but talking about something besides sports and politics, although everything is influenced by politics. We are really happy to bring on Live from the Heartland, Andrea Bunch and Alicia Hurtado. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, an event coming up from covers to cover to benefit the Chicago Abortion Network. So let's uh, let's take it away. Who wants to start? Andrea, you go first. Hi, thanks for having us on, Michael. It's so good to see you. So we're here to talk about Covers for Cover, which is December 9th and 10th. December 9th is a live stream show on YouTube, and December 10th is at Lincoln Hall. And we have 23 girl-powered bands, and we're all raising funds for the Chicago Abortion Fund this year. Every year we raise funds for a different Chicago charity, and we're so proud and excited to raise funds for a Chicago Abortion Fund this year. Let me ask you how Covers for Covers came to be. Oh, Mia Park, 14 years ago, Mia Park started Covers for Cover. And every year it was at Shuba's. And we got to the point where we were uh, shoulder to shoulder and nose to nose in Shuba's. <laughs> I mean, a total blast with this show. And um, so they are so kind. They're so supportive, the folks at Shuba's and Lincoln Hall. And they said, how about we try this out at Lincoln Hall? And the very next year was the pandemic. So at that time, we learned to make it into a live stream show as well. So for a couple years, we did live stream shows. And now that we can be out and about and we understand how live stream works, we have morphed it into two shows. And uh, Mia Park, five or six years ago, said, Andrea, would you like to take this over? And I said, I sure would. This is a thing I want to see you keep going. Well, this is good. Andrea used to, I would just say, because say, you told me, you reminded me that you used to work at the Heartland Cafe, which used to be the home base for this show. And I do have a fondness for Lincoln Hall. It was the Three Penny Cinema. And I met my first wife, who was the popcorn girl there back in the old days. Uh, and I, my kids band Twin Peaks played there a lot. So it's a great venue. And I'm glad you, you've expanded to uh, in need of a bigger hall. Um, <laughs> Let me uh, just ask you a little bit about in the past, Covers for Cover has raised money for uh, various organizations. You want to share a little bit of some of the uh, beneficiaries of your good work? Yeah, you bet. So um, every year we pick a different um, charity in Chicago that serves women or mostly women in the city. Um, last year, uh, we supported Girl Forward, which is an organization that supports teen girls in Chicago who are refugees displaced by war and other conflicts. And uh, last year, we made it to $25,000 for Girl Forward. And the year before that, we raised funds for the Dreamcatcher Foundation, which, which helps Chicago women and girls escape sex trafficking. And that organization is run by people who are survivors of sex trafficking. It's amazing. And we we're so proud we got to $35,000 that year in 2020. So we'd like to raise at least $25,000 for Chicago Abortion Fund this year. Um, we've also worked with the Chicago Women's Health Center, Chicago House, Unity Parenting, and other great charities in the city. Andrea, can you share uh, where the name came from and what it means? Yeah, so when Mia Park first began it, she had a great focus of all the artists who come to play, we play covers, right? So if I cover somebody else's songs that's not mine, it's called a cover. Um, and she would always focus on providing housing. So it started off with a big housing focus. So that's cover. So got it. Play covers for cover. And that's how the name <laughs> came about, as far as I understand it. 
That's good. And I I kind of figured it had to be something about covers. <laughs> yeah. Um, Elisa, how about talking a little bit about the Chicago Abortion Network and the good work that you all are doing in these uh, really challenging times around that issue? Absolutely. So um, the Chicago Abortion Fund, we... I feel like when you when you hear the words abortion fund, it kind of seems obvious what we do. Um, so I always like to start off with the first thing that people might think of, which is that we fund abortions. Um, but as you said, right now the landscape is quite difficult, and it quite honestly has been quite difficult for people, especially if they're um, they don't have the means to afford their abortion procedure, if they don't have the means to travel for their abortion procedure for for quite some time. So we provide financial support, which is kind of in the form of directly paying for folks' appointment costs. We provide logistical support, um, which is less cut and dry. It's really anything to get someone from point A to point B that's not those procedure costs. So it can be um, support with booking transportation and paying for transportation, lodging, rides, childcare, lost wages, meals and medication. Um, there's just a lot that goes into getting someone through the doors of an abortion clinic that folks may not think of. Um, and then the last piece is emotional support. And this really comes through, I think, in the way that our helpline is set up. So when you call the Chicago Abortion Fund, you're matched up with one case manager who kind of stays with you until you get the care that you need. Um, so we're taking some of that stress away from folks and that we can connect them directly to other resources. We can be their last call that they make. And then until they, they get whatever gaps or barriers they're facing down to zero, we're the ones that can kind of be that connecting piece. Um, but also we're there to provide affirmation, um, just kind of non-judgmental support and any sort of further emotional resources someone might need. Um, and I think that just kind of to bring it back for, for to covers for cover, um, something that you're saying, Andrea, when you were talking about the origins of the the name covers for cover, I kind of think of a lot of what we do as care work um, and just, you know, like really loving on our grantees and our callers. And I think that there's like physical ways to cover people with roofs, but there's also ways that we can um, cover and protect and care for one another. Um, and I think that that we definitely fall under that category. I think so too. Yeah. Let me let me ask uh, either of you or both of you. Um, have you seen or the movie Jane ever about the Chicago Abortion Network that was back in the late sixties into the seventies? Yeah. So actually, the the Janes who they kind of created this underground. Um, network, getting people to abortion care before um, Roe was in place, before it was legal for folks who haven't seen the movie or haven't heard of the Janes. Um, and actually, one of the original Janes founded the Chicago Abortion Fund, or is one of the founders of the Chicago Abortion Fund. And they're kind of um, tireless, not only advocacy, but really just like putting their network out there being like very materially showing up for people in Chicago who were who were in need of abortion care even when they were in danger like that I think that spirit really defines the repro movement here in Chicago for sure yeah, I, I brought it brought it up because I would think they're inspirational uh Heather Booth who was the founder of the original Jane person uh has been a guest on our show a number of times you know she's pretty involved in progressive politics and um I just recently showed the film again and had uh, Katie Hogan and Mary Driscoll come in and talk to my DePaul class. I do that every year. Anyhow, uh, so the Chicago Abortion Fund is doing some great work and uh, Cover for Cover is helping to raise some money. How about, Andrea, you give us a little more on the bands who's playing. I have a list of some of them. Maybe you want to call attention to a few of them. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to give you a big list because we have such a great lineup of folks playing. I'm so excited to see every single one of these acts. So December 9th, Friday night on YouTube at 7 o'clock, there's a live stream show for folks who would like to watch from home. And the artists in that show are Coral DeClave, Sean Wiggins, Aaron Tedesco, Melissa Chin, The Twilight Stealers, Lindsay Weinberg, Marnie Schur, Paula Swartz-McKernan, Megan Judy, 
Nancy Ruggeri and Robin Lee Garber. They've all made these beautiful videos for that show that night. And then December 10th, Saturday night at Lincoln Hall, we're all playing covers. So the bands that you'll hear covered by all these different acts are the Beastie Boys, Fiona Apple, Amy Winehouse, Neil Young, uh, Clamor and Lace Noise Brigade is going to cover Pop Divas. They're such a fun marching band. Um, Alanis Morissette will get covered. My band's going to cover Rage Against the Machine, which I'm totally stoked about. <laughs> you'll hear Adele, Lizzo, Pat Benatar. Turn Up the Volume is going to lead a joyful dance party. Sarah Ratcliffe is really great at leading groups of people and really fun dance moves that you can follow. And members of the Gingers are going to cover Motley Crue in their cleverly named band, Motley Cruella. <laughs> so it's a wonderful long night. We have all kinds of ways to raise funds for Chicago Abortion Fund. We've got 50-50 raffle. Your ticket money will go to them. And you can also donate directly to Chicago Abortion Fund in any amount on the website. Covers for Cover has a page on their website as well. And we'll send you all the links. And uh, so people can go to, they can just type in Covers for Cover and they'll be able to find it. And it's true also with the Chicago Abortion Fund. Yeah. That people can get on, information. On Facebook well, and Instagram, if you search Covers for Cover, then our, our pages will come up. And Alicia, is it Chicago Abortion Fund on those places? Yep, you can just type in Chicago Abortion Fund and we'll come up. I love this new technology. Here we are talking to people all over the country sometimes, yeah. and we're sitting at home. I mean, it's it's, a, it's something else. <laughs> well, I think we've got the info. Basically, give us the date again. It's Friday and Saturday, the 9th and 10th. The 9th and 10th, you got it. That's of it. December. Yeah. And um, I know that... Uh, you talked about the Twilight Steelers and you're playing a little of their music, but since you are uh, going to do a performance with a bunch of friends, as you call it, <laughs> how about you doing a little bit of a tune uh, right now and we'll get to watch you and hear you depending on how people are listening. And if we have time at the end, we can add some more music, but I'd much rather have uh, you who we're talking to than someone that I don't know about yet. You bet. Here we I'm go. Gonna play, I'm going to play just a little bit of a Cindy Lauper song called Sally's Pigeons. And in the beginning of this song, she introduces that she has a friend when they were eight and they were little girls who played together. And they fall in love with the boys next door. And she loses her friend to a back alley abortion. That's what the song is about. So definitely on the sadder side for Cindy Lauper, but a really important song and good for our event. So I'm going to start about halfway through it because I know we only have so much time. So we got My heart began to skip to the beat of the boy next door. She had her eye across the street on someone shy and tall. We lived our dreams and challenged fate. In tears she told me she was late. And Sally let his pigeons out to fly. On the dresser sits a frame with a photograph. Two little girls in ponytails some 21 years back. She left one night with just an odd was Lost from some back alley job, I close my eyes and Sally's pigeons fly. She never saw those birds again, and me, I can't remember when a pirate smile hasn't made me cry. And Sally let his Pigeons out to fly. Ah. Thank you so much, Michael, for having us on. Hey, you have a great day and a great uh, night and a good week and uh, good luck. And uh, <laughs> Everyone else out there knows you've been listening to the Live from the Heartland show. You may be watching it on Can TV, or you may be watching it on YouTube.com slash Heartland Media. 
I will have my photographs up and show up on Sundays at Archie's Cafe uh, in the 1200 block of Loyola. And so Sunday, 11 to 3, anyone wants to run into me, haven't had enough, I'll be over there all December on Sunday. And uh, we encourage you all to do good in the world because the world needs all the good that you do, that we all do together. Tell me how you do it. People, see you next week.